This is Robin Kern, and I am going to talk about the Willowbrook School for the Disabled and the hepatitis study that was performed there. The Willowbrook School was opened from 1942 to 1987. The school's purpose was to provide a place for children and adults with differing abilities where they could live and receive care. To understand the issues surrounding the hepatitis study at Willowbrook, one must begin with the normal care of children with differing abilities. As a parent of a child with autism, the history surrounding the rights and cares of individuals with disabilities is horrifying. In the 1900s and before, the medical view was that these individuals could not learn and there were no interventions that would help improve their lives. In the early 1900s, parents became aware of the living conditions at these schools. Parents began advocating for their children and collaborating to improve the conditions. The parents were concerned about overcrowding and the lack of sanitary living areas. The homes offered limited help. The parents believed, however, that they could help their children improve their lives. The medical community vilified and ostracized these parents. This perception changed in the 1950s when two American women, Pearl Buck and Dale Evans Rogers, acknowledged the birth of children with disabilities. Pearl Buck was an author. Dale Evans Rogers was the wife of famous cowboy Roy Rogers. Dale Evans Rogers wrote and published a book titled Angel Unaware that described their daughter, Robin Elizabeth, short two-year life with Down syndrome. Willowbrook was a home for these children with disabilities located in Staten Island, New York. This is a picture of what the school looked like in the early 1960s. The school was built to house 4,000 individuals, but at any given time housed over 6,000. The nurse to resident ratio was one to 200. Due to the enormous number of residents, Willowbrook was chronically underfunded. This underfunding led to conditions that allowed the spread of diseases like hepatitis. The public was unaware of the conditions because the school had few visitors and was isolated. In 1954, Dr. Saul Krugman was asked to join the staff of Willowbrook. He was a pediatrician who specialized in infectious diseases. He was hired to help prevent the spread of diseases like hepatitis in the school. He proposed a study to find how the disease spread. Additionally, he sought to determine how gamma globulin would affect the disease and if immunity could be obtained by taking gamma globulin. His proposal identified children as his subjects because the disease produced mild symptoms in the children rather than the severe symptoms seen in adults. The federal government and the New York School of Medicine funded his study. He reported his data to journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, throughout the study. The study lasted from the 1950s until the 1970s. This is a sample of the consent letter that was sent to parents. When you look at the wording on this um, consent letter, as Rosenbaum 2020 pointed out with statements from parents who felt their children would not be admitted if they did not sign, the wording is very coercive. In fact, the permission form enclosed for your consideration, if you wish to have your child given the benefit of this new preventative treatment, sign the form. So as the new students came in, the healthy students were the ones who were identified to be part of the study. The results of the study did contribute to healthcare and provided us with information that we still utilize today. So the published results included the identification of two separate hepatitis viruses. We now know them as hepatitis A and B. He learned that the virus was how it was spread and that the different types of viruses were spread differently. He noticed a difference in the progression of the symptoms of each of the viruses and the development of immunity, which led to the development of a vaccine. They also learned how to prevent the spread of these two viruses. 
which has led to the infection control measures we use today. Also, the addition of identifying long-term complications of these diseases has helped to further the vaccine for hepatitis B. They identified the second virus was the cause of long-term complications like cirrhosis and liver cancer. They also found how gamma globulin affects the symptoms and the progression of the disease. There was no data, however, on the long-term effects of these healthy children who were given the hepatitis. So once the study was stopped in the 1970s, there was no data collected on these individuals. So what ethical principles were violated with Dr. Krugman and his study? Well, the first was autonomy or informed consent. The consent was very coercive. The children who were being admitted were healthy. Those children were required to, those parents were required to sign that their children be part of that. But they did not cover completely what was going to happen. They didn't tell the parent that they were going to actively infect their child with hepatitis. Beneficence. The study did not minimize harm while maximizing the benefit for others. Yes, they found several things that benefited healthcare as a whole, but not at the expense of exposing and infecting children with the virus. Non-malfeasance. They took healthy children and exposed them to the virus. They justified this action by stating the children would get the hepatitis anyway. If you dig into the research that is there, the data that is provided, they infected these individuals with hepatitis. One way was by milkshakes. They took the feces of infected residents, mixed it in a milkshake, put extra chocolate in it, and then forced it on the children to give them hepatitis. Non-malfeasance was definitely violated. Justice, no other children had to and, um, consent to be infected with hepatitis to get Raymond board. So they were not treated fairly. And finally, veracity, the truth. The parents in the public did not receive the whole truth regarding this study. The contribution to the ethical principles that we now have in place are readily seen. The Willowbrook experiment was exposed by a doctor who was a whistleblower and went to Geraldo Rivera in the 1970s. This was one of um, Geraldo Rivera's biggest stories in the 70s. The story was published around the same time as the Tuskegee experiment, which also had a whistleblower. The horrors of both of these studies led to the development of the National Research Act of 1974 and the Belmont Report of 1979, which developed the principles for research studies and the rights of participants in those studies. Additionally, institutional review boards were to be developed, or IRBs, were to be developed in facilities that were utilizing any type of research on human subjects. Ironically, Dr. Krugman was appointed the president of the American Pediatric Society in the 1970s after this was exposed. The Willowbrook School was ordered to close in the 1980s by the government. It took them until 1987 to find housing, appropriate housing for all of the individuals that were in the school. These are the references that I used for my presentation. Thank you so much for listening.